Welcome to this exploration of defense in the battalion combat series of war games. In earlier videos I've done about BCS, I've noted that it's primarily a game system that's interested in exploring maneuver and attack, which is great, makes for a fun war game. But if you happen to find yourself as the defensive player, then that's a slight problem. And it's a problem I'm going to have because in a couple of weeks' time, I'm going to be playing the Americans in Last Blitzkrieg. So I thought I'd use that as a case study to explore how to defend well. So I'm going to start with an analysis of the start positions of the Americans in Last Blitzkrieg because any complex game like these really benefit from having a close look at what you've got to play with. Secondly, I'm going to address the big question of any defender, should I stay or should I go, attacking, uh, holding or falling back. And then thirdly, I'm going to look at the rules systems within BCS, which when combined really help you achieve a successful defense. The start position on the 16th of December, just in the run up towards Christmas, a quiet part of the front in difficult terrain and deep snow. Who would have imagined this would become uh, the site of Germany's last major counterattack? I'll go through the units from north to south. So in the far north, we have the 2nd Infantry Division, a very experienced division with good action rating. So dual AR4 infantry divisions, nine of them, and a slightly weaker engineer, and a bonus a dual recon unit, as well as three support units, one of them being uh, red AV and two of them having ranges of two hexes and a very generous nine artillery. That's about three German divisions worth of intrinsic artillery in one division. The fatigue is, however, only one. They are occupying only four hexes of the front line because they are just arriving and integrating into the front line. And so they're buddies with the 99th Division, who have slightly better fatigue, only six artillery and the one support unit, and an AR of three. They hold 14 hexes, so together they hold 18. In comparison, the 14th Cavalry has to hold six hexes, one third of that, with only three dual recon units and a light tank unit. That's quite a stretch for a unit that is notionally in prepared defense, but most if not all of these units only have a move side, so can't be in prepared defense. The 106th Infantry Division is an altogether different kettle of fish. It's new in theater, its AR is only two, like the 99th, it's just one level down and it has to hold 18 hexes, so the same as the 2nd and 99th combined, which is thin, but not as thin as the 28th Infantry Division. Here we see the 112th Regiment. It has an AR-4 in its three infantry units couple of artillery and a support, it has to hold nine hexes, so half a division's worth with one third of a division. And if we go to the southern end of the front, we see first of all CCR from the 9th Armoured Division, another relatively inexperienced unit with uh, two AR ratings. It's not on the front line, it's slightly behind, so it sort of constitutes a bit of a reserve. The 28th Division's 110 and also 109 hold a huge chunk of the front. The 110 has to hold 20 hexes, one regiment covering the same as two divisions. No wonder they're broken down into six companies and a battalion. They're good quality, but they are super stretched thinly. The 109 only has to cover six hexes, which is a altogether much more reasonable frontage. CCA from the 9th Armoured has a small three hex frontage, but again is a relatively weak unit. Um, they, their AR is mainly three. And then finally, you have part of the 4th Infantry Division, which is similar to the 2nd Infantry Division, very experienced with four AR units, 
uh, plenty of support, plenty of artillery, but they have to cover 11 hexes of the front. To see that on the map, I've drawn them out. You are looking west. The Germans are down below. So north is up here with the 99th and the 2nd Infantry Division together. Then the 14th Cavalry, the extended 109th with its AR of 2. The line here is lighter to recognize the, uh, the weakness of the AR. The darker AR4 of the 28th and the 28th and the 28th after they're uh, covering their huge front with a little bit of CCR9 behind. CCA 9th Armoured is uh, over here and then the 4th Infantry holding the other end of the flank. Looking at that from the German perspective, what they're really interested in is how to make progress along the road system, which is the only way really that they can move forward with any speed because so much of the terrain is terrible here, more of which later. So here is a schematic view of the road system. Let me just get rid of me. So you can see they are very much focused on going in certain directions at this early kicking off point. You can see the Bulligan and Sandvith and this road junction just to the east of Clairvaux are all really important to be able to take them off into the interior of the Ardennes as well as uh, move to stop some of these reinforcement hexes which uh, could potentially outflank them. I've also marked when the various bridges in the south become free. Most of them you can see are on the 17th. And in the north, the overpass here also becomes available to the Germans on the, 9th, on the 17th. Which means that the southern part of the front on Nulltag, as the Germans call D-Day, is going to be quiet for the first day. Pop me back on. All you have to do, as the Americans, is really hold out for these first seven days. So let's explore what's going to happen across that timeline. On Null Tag itself, you're going to have a minus two on your snafu, and the Germans are going to have a plus one. If you're using historical weather, it's normal, but the atmospherics are poor and your visibility is only one. So progress is primarily going to be in the north, and the only real reinforcement is CCB of the 9th Armoured Division uh, arriving at Sandvith. On the 17th, those bridges in the south, most of them become open. The snafu mods stay the same. It's mud, and the visibility is quite open now. So the attacks in the south will get going, but the north starts to receive some reinforcements. On the 18th, the mud continues, but the US airborne forces arrive along with parts of other divisions. And the US snafu modifier goes down to uh, minus one. On the 19th, the Germans lose their snafu bonus. The mud continues and the reinforcements continue as well. The 20th, sees the last uh, remnants of new units arriving for the next few days, but the mud continues. So, you know, if I was playing the Germans, this is quite a dispiriting array of days. Mud, 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 historically, and reinforcements on the 17th, 18th, 19th, a little bit on the 20th. 21st is the last day in which the Americans have a minus on their snafu. Uh, conditions historically return to normal. And it's, if you like, the calm before the American storm, because on the 22nd, they go big on their reinforcements. Eight and a half divisions arrive, boosted by 22, yes, 22 artillery points to be attached on top. So that's the point at which the Americans can start thinking about organizing their major counterattack rather than just holding on. The defensive strengths for the Americans over that first week, whilst they hold on and absorb the German offensive until the 22nd, is that, well, the German plan's really stupid, and that's just not me. That's, you know, Gerd von Frunstedt, 
of Alpha Modal and Alfred Yodel and plenty of other officers tried repeatedly to get Hitler to change the plan. The uh, final objective of Antwerp, of course, is laughable. Uh, the disposition of forces with too many panzers up in the north under Dietrich in the 6th Panzer Army is doesn't take advantage of the geography. Um, it's, you know, it, it's an attack that's fundamentally not going anywhere. The US positions on the flanks are both strong, with the 4th Infantry in the south and the 2nd Infantry in the north. The defensive terrain, more of which later, is really suits the defence down to the ground. You couldn't have asked for worse attacking terrain, including a number of north-south running rivers. The road network is very limited. It's, it's not as if it's going to be a major surprise to see which way the Germans are going to go. The hold phase, as I'm calling it, of reinforcements, that first seven days, sees these reinforcements on day two, three, and four. So however much you're being knocked about, you will get fresh formations coming in to fill in some of those gaps. The counterattack phase, which begins on day seven, these these eight and a half divisions coming in. I mean, that's that's a tidy sum of formations to have in your back pocket. Uh, you know, the defensive time for the Americans is certainly not forever. The Germans, therefore, need to take risks. A German that doesn't take risks is a German that's not going to win. So in order to keep to any kind of timetable and to get as far forward as possible before those big reinforcements, the Germans have to put their foot down. And in putting their foot down, they will make themselves vulnerable. Movement for the Germans is impeded by choke, pot, choke pots, choke points everywhere, everywhere. And in the south, those bridges will protect the units for the first day at least, and possibly a couple of days, making life inconvenient for the Germans. Also in the south, the German forces are just weaker. Defensive weaknesses for the Americans are the centre. You know, it is overextended and the 106th Division is a poor unit. Generally, the Americans at start are less mobile, and also their command radiuses are shorter. The negative uh, snafu, running from turn one to turn six, is going to mean that almost all of your activations are going to be uh, partials, with the odd fail to, to boot. In the north, most of the formations are used or done on the 16th, so they're not uh, going to be able to do very much. Uh, they also have to face the best German units in the north, and only that one bridge, the overpass, is closed in the north, so it's pretty open for the Germans to get their attacking boots on. The weather hinders Allied air power and also hinders the engagement zones. And Having a lot of mainly partial activations against mainly full activations for the Germans has seed them the initiative. You, you will be limited in what you can do. And finally, because of that limitation, it's quite hard to know where to put the reinforcements as they arrive because the situation is dynamic and the Germans are able to bypass some of the strong points particularly if you put a formation in, you know, position A, well, they can just decide to go to uh, position B instead. Hold or fall back. So as the American, with that disposition of forces, with the weak center, the question is, do I just stay there and take my lumps and wait until the Germans overrun those formations? Or do I try and gradually uh, go backwards? And what would that look like? So to hold, it seems to me that, yes, the US Army can try and hold out or hold to the extent that they can delay the Germans significantly before they're overwhelmed on that front line. You can use those at start forces. They are bolstered by continual reinforcements uh, over several days. 
you know that you'll be able to counterattack on the 22nd. So if bits of your line open up and German panzers go roaring through, well, you can just, you know, wave goodbye, knowing that they are simply increasing their exposed flanks as they drive further and further uh, into the west. The pros of this is if you hold, it will delay the German advance as much as is possible, and it will encourage the Germans to take greater risks as they get increasingly frustrated. Or, of course, it may actually um, psychologically defeat the Germans who begin to think, well, this game system's broken, I can't attack anywhere. Um, if you're playing with the classic victory conditions, which some people do, some people don't, uh, it certainly does encourage you to hold as many of those uh, victory hexes as possible. Obviously, the con is you your forces will get attrited and you will take major losses and some of those formations will disappear. Um, but look at all these lovely chaps who will come during the 17th, 18th, 19th and 20th to make life harder for the Germans as they attempt to rush. If you want to fall back, it seems to me that firstly, there is nothing particularly sacred on the front line. And there is a huge amount of very difficult space to tempt the Germans to try and advance into. So, you know, why not let them stick their neck out? Here's a look at the north part of the map. We have the German front line here and the River Meuse here. And here is a rough sketch of the most difficult terrain. So that's rolling and slopes, forests and uh, rivers. Uh, I haven't included woods that would have covered even more of the available frontage. And as you can see, it's very, very nasty. We have a look uh, in the south in the same process. Again, the German front line and the Meuse over there. Again, you can see these great swaths of horrible attacking terrain and this big valley uh, with Bastogne in the middle of it. Uh, to my mind, this is actually quite interesting perspective because on the one hand, you can clearly see how Bastogne is in more easily attackable terrain, even though there's defensible terrain around it and is, as is Samvith, a major communications hub with roads going in all sorts of directions. But it's also a little bit, in my mind, of a um, cul-de-sac, because it doesn't really take you anywhere. Most of the targets uh, are towards the north, so you'd have to go through Bastogne and then sweep into these northern cities. If we have a little look at these two together, you can see how to cross the Meuse, you really have to go up through this kind of direction or come in and go through there. I mean, to be honest, there's not really a great attacking channel for anybody to go through. Um, and as a German, I find this map very depressing. And as an American, I find it very encouraging. So to fall back, with all these bridges, especially the ones that can be blown, that, you know, focus the Germans to attack and lots of road junctions uh, in difficult terrain and river hexides to cross and slopes and marshes and woods and forests and fords and cities and victory hexes. Bottlenecks are plenty. I had a little look at this map and I thought, where are the major bottlenecks? And I came up with this list. But, you know, honestly, I could have I could have replicated this, multiplied it by five or something. Um, that's just a few underneath me as well, just for good measure. Um, it's just all over the place where the Americans can stand and make a bit of a fight, however much of a fight that is. However much of a fight kind of depends on how you are going to exploit the different elements of the BCS rules to come together to make a good defense. So, first of all, you have the various zones, zones of control, zones of engagement, screening zones, that are all there to stop you or slow you down. 
So I've just done a sort of quick summary of the zones. So if you're a non-AV zone of control, i.e. infantry, you stop leg and truck. And if you are a support AV zone of control, you stop leg and truck and also tack MA, but they may engage. And if they're successful in that engagement, they may continue. If they are real AV, they also stop everybody. This time the AV units must engage. And again, if they're successful, they can continue. Engagement zones stop trucks, um, depending on what the visibility is. Obviously engagement zones of one get superseded by the zones of control. So we only really worried about engagement zones of two or more, and they're restricted by the weather and the visibility, but occasionally that can come into play. I think underappreciated is the importance of screening zones. They add one MP against move side units, three hexes away from the screening unit. So a seven hex wide circle, truck and tech MA cannot actually go through the screening units hex. So if you have the screening unit on a road, they can't get through it. Only a deployed leg MA can do that. Um, so this, I think, has the opportunity in this restricted terrain to just add to the pain of trying to move for the Germans. Obviously, this is, you know, a very rich area of the rules, and you should check out the uh, detailed charts for the, uh, the full details. But zones, particularly when you explore these zones with terrain, can make for a significant degrading of German maneuver. Speaking of terrain, there are all of these interesting terrain types. Again, I've simplified them out and listed them by worst to least worst. Um, so major rivers take an entire all the leg movement to cross and are prohibited for truck and tack MA. Uh, they also provide bonuses for regular attacks and barrages, and they are what was called originally defensible terrain, key terrain. Marsh is uh, similar. Ordinary rivers are still pretty nasty. And again, you can only cross these effectively on bridges. Um, slopes are almost as bad as well. And then forest and woods and rolling just add a lot of extra uh, difficulty. Stops for attack MA and truck MA and loads of uh, movement uh, points I get for rolling, for stream. The, the numbers in square brackets are the slightly improved figures for when the weather is freezing. Um, so you can see here for some of these, if you combine them with um, greening zones, uh, how painful some of that can be. So much prohibited terrain, as we saw earlier, so much stop terrain, um, so much terrain that slows you down. And we're not even talking about uh, traffic combat results, which can pop up and also make you stop. And for advanced players, such as ourselves, my friends, who will be playing unit traffic, um, and, you know, the usual nonsense around crossing the streams and coordination, making making the rear areas difficult to coordinate, to keep your snafu activation rolls up high. Just opportunities for things to get clogged up all over the place. Next up, prepared defence. I'm assuming you've all read the, uh, the support booklet that cautions against using prepared defence as a cure-all for everything. I would recommend that you use prepared defense if you don't want to retreat, obviously. Also, if you don't want to counterattack, because a lot of the penalties of prepared defense are that it makes counterattacking weaker. But if you didn't want to do that, then that's fine. Uh, if you are in key, key terrain, or if some of you is in key terrain and the rest of you isn't, then prepared defense makes it all kind of like uh, key terrain. If your formation is mainly infantry, uh, they will largely benefit from prepared defense. If you have weak artillery, another of the major negatives of prepared defense is that it halves uh, your artillery. But if you didn't have many artillery to begin with, it doesn't really matter. Conversely, 
if you've got a huge amount of artillery, it also probably doesn't matter. You know, if you've got 12 artillery points, oh dear, I can only attack with six. So you do get the plus one in defense for a pro defense. And if you can combine that with being behind a hexide terrain feature like a river, if you are dual or infantry or standoff in terrain or a city hex, then you could be looking at a plus three on your die roll mods and avoid having to retreat and just taking a step loss. And most of the American units have big number of steps. You know, six is very common. The con is obviously your artillery is halved and your movement is halved. You get minus one on your attack and because you can't do a double objective, effectively you're getting a minus two on your attack. So you can see minus two on attacks, with a well-placed prep death getting a, a plus three on the defense. So, you know, it's quite a, a big swing. Obviously you only get a partial activation, but if you've got, you know, minuses on your snafu roll, partial activations are fine. And you can use prep defense in combination with counterattacking. So uh, I love this picture, by the way. This don't work. Spearhead caught it. Too bad. Spearhead being the uh, the third armored division. If you use prepared defense to fix the Germans and then bring in units on the flank to counterattack, I think that's a very, very beautiful maneuver. For the Germans, their strength is pretty brittle. You know, they've got lots of two and three step units. So if you attack them, um, with some destruction barrages, particularly a destruction barrage in front of a, um, a regular attack, they, they can melt away pretty quickly. Their infantry is pretty poor. Threes and twos and one action ratings are common. Two is probably the most common, probably three in the Panzer divisions. They really only have two good Volksgrenadier divisions to play with. So if you're going to counterattack, have a look at those Volksgrenadier divisions because they're, they're not strong, not strong at all. Their artillery is weak. An intrinsic strength of three per formation is pretty common and they have very few that are assigned. Their mobility is very uneven. Yes, the Panzer divisions can go rushing around, but everyone else has to leg it slowly. Support is also quite fragile. They mainly only have two-step units, Stugs for the infantry and Jagdpanzers for the Panzer divisions. And their flanks are inevitably going to become extended because they don't have very good screening units and the gap between the Panzers and the Volksgrenadiers is going to grow. So these formations that are attacking you, you know, they've been hastily assembled. They've been comprised of poor uh, reservists. They're not at full strength, and they are just vulnerable to being worn down by repeated counterattacks and repeated barrages. You know, don't be shy as the Americans to get stuck in there and begin to wear the Germans down. And using combined arms techniques is the way forward with this. So, you know, as I've discussed in previous division um, videos, armor is for engagements and attack by fire and assists. Your recon is for setting stretch objectives beyond the original objectives of the division and also for screening. Try not to use them as combat units because they tend to be brittle themselves. The infantry is for defending and for doing well supported regular attacks and the artillery is for destruction and suppression barrages. Usually in most of the games, we go with the suppression barrage because it only costs one artillery strength point and you get a nice minus two on a regular attack and minus one on a shock attack. Support is for supporting. Yes, the Americans do have quite a few supporting units, but I would argue don't give in to popping them out and making them into an extra unit because the support zones and controls can be vulnerable in making the Germans stop and engage. Uh, ARIAS, there you are, it's an acronym for you. It should be an acronym, sadly isn't. As the Americans, I'm certainly planning to try and disengage CCA, R and B of the 9th Armoured Division out of the front line, as well as the 14th Cavalry out of the front line and replacing them as soon as I can with some of these infantry formations so that they can 
set up some block up, uh, blocks behind the line so you have to retreat you can retreat through them and then the germans have to deploy as if they're going to attack these units and then retreat those units on top of them also use them to counterattack any of the early exposed units and to screen sectors of the front to really slow down german advances artillery so in some respects PCS's artillery system is pretty abstracted, but this is a game in which they come to the fore. We all use suppression, as I've noted, attack barrages and regular and shock attack. It's very good. But you get these destruction barrages, and the Americans are allowed to do destruction barrages on the barrage table of two, not one, as is normal uh, artillery points as well as destruction barrages with a uh, regular attack of three points. Now, because you have divisions with six and nine artillery, and you'll be getting more unassigned artillery to assign to divisions, you can really go to town attacking kind of every unit in the formation that's in front of you. These unassigned artillery allow you to take them away from one formation, and then go and stick them somewhere else. Now, yes, you do lose a day's worth of artillery, but you can mass them and suddenly have them appear a day later in a completely different part of the front and cause the Germans a world of barraging hurt. And just to see what that looks like, um, I've tracked how many artillery you get. So at start, the Americans are just under 40. Just over half of that is intrinsic and just under half of that is assigned. And then in the first week, you get a similar amount, just over 40, most of which is intrinsic, few more assigned. And then on the 22nd, and the 21st to a lesser degree, you get this great big chunk of unassigned artillery as well as a fair bit of assigned. And then in the third week, uh, another mid twenties worth of artillery. If we represent that on a cumulative graph, this is what the Germans are looking at. So they start out with just under 40 and then move to about 80. And after the first week, and then in the second week, they go up to around about 140 and then get to about 170 by the third week. That's a massive, massive amount of artillery. And the ability to redeploy these unassigned assigned units to different formations, I think should be part of your counterattacking strategy. Retreating. Now, no one really loves to retreat, you know, we don't uh, go to a different gaming table and say, well, you should have seen the retreat I've just done there. It was magnificent. But falling back in Last Blitzkrieg, as well as Panzer's Last Stand, is pretty easy because of the terrain. And you don't, in either of those two games, have to worry too much about a linear front line because of that terrain really forcing everybody to go down the road. So when you retreat, I would encourage you to think about what kind of re retreat are you going to? You could be going to a blocking position, a, a small step back to avoid losing too much ground too quickly, to make the Germans advance, but not hold them up for too long. I mean, it'd be brilliant if you made the Germans, you know, go into move mode and then rush forward, but then have to go into deployed mode to then begin to try and assault this blocking position. Stop line is a bigger fallback. And here you're not just staying and holding ground for a fair while. You're forcing the Germans to get several formations up, moved up, go into deployed mode, try and set up a major attack. And then finally, what I've called a springboard line which could be a stop line, where you actually want to fix the Germans. It's not that you want to hold this area in order to defend a victory hex or a river crossing or something in particular. You want to just hold the Germans and grab their attention so that you can come up 
and counterattack. And that counterattack could either go directly through your defensive formation, although that gets a little bit all um, coordination and mixed and stuff, and more likely and better coming up through the flanks, the exposed flanks of the Germans. I think if you have a clear view of what you're retreating to and what the job of that retreat line is, you'll kind of feel better about it. You won't just feel, oh, I have to go backwards. You'll feel much more in control and making a definite decision about how firm the retreat line is that you are going back to. So finally, to bring that all together, um, I think the keys to a successful defense in BCS, particularly in a terrain rich environment like Last Blitzkrieg and Panzer's Last Stand, is to use the terrain and the zones together to maximize making the attacker's movement as awkward and difficult as possible, clog them up, use prep dev and counterattacks together so that you keep the Germans worried and that you don't seed the initiative. So you're not just retreating because that's the only thing you can do. You are shaping the battle by using prepared defense and counterattacks to match the Germans in their attacking ways and not just being passive. Using artillery and combined arms to wear the enemy down. Artillery for the Americans here is an absolute godsend. So use it creatively just as much as you use your armored formations to seriously disrupt and cause surprise across the battlefield. And then retreat with purpose. Be intentional in your retreats. Know that you are controlling space and time. You're not just being pushed back at the Germans' tempo, that you are setting your own tempo. And I think together, this will help keep your spirits up because one of the hardest things when you are spending a day or two having your head kicked by a triumphant Nazi is, you know, not letting your head droop and your lower lip, you know, get a bit sad and keeping your spirits up, keeping your confidence, knowing that you are controlling the battlefield as much as possible. Um, yes, it takes two. Uh, taking losses, but doing it in a way that is not dispiriting because you are confident and comfortable that you are being a right royal pain in the ass or ass, if you prefer. And that, I think, makes for a brilliant and successful defense that you can go to the other gaming table and brag about how well you defended. Thanks for watching. Stay safe.